I'm Hinda Sklar. I'm the librarian here, and I'm going to introduce to you our lecturer this evening, our special guest. Patrick Keating Clay um, has a wonderfully long and varied career. Uh, he started out uh, with a, he says, a protected childhood near Stonehenge, and then studied here at the AA during the war years. He then went on to ETH in Zurich and studied engineering. Along the way, uh, after that, he met Siegfried Gideon, who became his mentor, and whose daughter he incidentally ended up running off with and marrying, I understand. Um, he interned in the atelier of Le Cabousier, where uh, he lived actually at the time in the Swiss pavilion, and he did the drawings for the Unité d'Habitation. Along with all of this that was going on, he met Brancusi at that time. Eventually, he migrated to the U.S. as an apprentice to Frank Lloyd Wright and was the job site representative for the Johnson Wax Building. He began painting and did some homesteading in the Arizona desert and then worked for about five years for SOM in Chicago in close association with Mies van der Rohe. He opened his architectural office in San Francisco and among one of the, uh, the most iconic buildings that he designed there is the San Francisco Art Institute. He also constructed other significant buildings in Los Angeles along with Richard Neutra and Charles Eames. He says that postmodernism, the fashion of postmodernism killed his practice and so he returned to Europe and he now lives in Spain with offices in Seville and Malaga. And structural and architectural work continues in New York Dusseldorf, and Zurich. Patrick Keating Clay. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? This is coming through. All right. I wanted to um, thank you and the reception when I came back here to the A for the first time in 60 years. It's a long time, 60 years. And um, I think the mood is super. <laughs> and I'm going to take advantage of this good mood to give you something which is not normally the presentation an architect gives, and it's not normally the view of history that historians give. I would like to say that I've been away for 60 years on what I call an odyssey, odyssey of a 20th century architect. So weaving in and out of some of the critical and perhaps the richest um, moments in architecture of the 20th century, I've had the luxury, and by accident, the luxury of making uh, friends and becoming a student, again, but a student as an apprentice to some great people. And I don't say at all that I made any contribution to those offices, but they made an enormous contribution to me. So I put this in the form of an uh, odyssey, odyssey of the 20th century. And I put it in somewhat of a poetic form. Um, meeting with people who are poetic in their very nature. So, we're going to begin. The impossible, the absolutely impossible happened. No. No, I think I know. The fall of Paris. Later, a few years later, Le Corbusier told us when we gathered together, 75,000 people were put to death during this time. 
All intellectuals left Paris or went underground. Jean-Paul Sartre, existentialist, wrote a very good play, Death Without a Sepulchre. This particular period in history is very difficult to imagine now. The British army was completely defeated on the continent, dribbled back pathetically to England. The Luftwaffe had air supremacy over all of England and could do what they liked. The king did nothing but stutter. In London, at night, people went underground. Henry Moore documents this moment, and again, coming to an individual seeing it. In the morning, coming out into the street, shattered. The Midland industries destroyed. The area around St. Paul is going up in flames. The slums of London destroyed. In the AA, where I was a student, the staff did not inspire, but the students did. There was a architectural or a student architectural student um, a committee in which the young people here in the AA took the lead. But there was a great man for me who taught me uh, engineering and he was uh, Felix Samueli and he inspired me into engineering. He said um, we must learn the essence of architecture which is structural engineering. He inspired me to understand the laws of Newton, the nature of steel and reinforced concrete, and said, you should look at every building you look at, look at its structure. This had an enormous effect on me. I felt this is the way we should go. He said, look, for example, at the Eiffel Tower, not built by an architect, but by a genius engineer, Eiffel, and that was his time. That is Spire on the left, he is the architect for the new epoch of Hitler. So in this depressed condition here in England and in London, a kind of apathy that we can't do anything until after the war. You always heard this expression, wait until after the war. But the poet, Winston Churchill, transformed himself into a bulldog, stepped onto the stage, and summoned the courage of all of England and it worked. Almost simultaneous, Bruce Martin, a student, stepped onto the table and said, this is our time, this is our hour, now. It is our time to make a new world. 
to think of architecture in a new way. We must work hard immediately as architects. We are students, and we will remain students all our lives, hopefully. But we are charged with the responsibility because of our place in history. With the A, here it was still dismal outside. The ruins were not cleared away. It looked a long, long time before the wheels would go back into motion. It was, in a way, a depressing time. But Bruce Martin brought to us, in a way, rather, I say, rather like Churchill, in a way, reflected into architecture, reflected into students, that they should be summoned for a great responsibility for the world that is going to be built, the new world. We had certain visions immediately when we thought of new architecture and the new world. This was one of them. Fresh, new, out in the shining, out in the country, out in the sunshine. And it was something absolutely the opposite of what was typical um, back here at home. We thought of inviting Le Corbusier to come to talk to us as students. We'll hear a lot about this tomorrow. But the idea of the poetic input of a great architect, I repeat the word, the poetic input, was something we really thirsted for. It was not coming from us. We must bring it in. So we wrote a request to Le Corbusier to come here. Now, I had two good friends here. We studied a lot together. We spent long hours together at night. And they were Peter Dickinson, who later on became a successful architect in Toronto, and Stephen Gardner, who wrote for the Times in architecture. And we decided to go to Paris directly. There was no reply from the le this letter. We went to Paris. We went to Le Corbusier's office. I took some of my work, showed it to Bodiansky, Wojonski, and they liked it. They thought it was good. And I asked if someday I could work, because now I'm going to go to school in engineering. When I come back, could I work in the Atelier uh, de Batisseur in uh, Rue de Sèvres? And he said, come back, tell us when the time is right, do your work, come back. And so uh, I went and studi I studied engineering the ETH. And I got a very, very good education in the Swiss uh, university. And understood new forms of um, engineering from a very great en Swiss engineer, Maya, Robert Maya. And I learned his system, which is very, very different from what we were learning in the academic school. Both were necessary. The analytical and treating a structure as a whole which is what Robert Meyer did. So the inspiration now was not only uh, Poissy, uh, here's the word, in the green, but it was also the Meyer structures crossing the ravines. And with Meyer, I was um, working together with Max Bill, the uh, sculptor, to write a book on this engineer. So it was my engineering input, together with his position as a sculptor, we made this book. I don't like it anymore. <laughs> it is the only book on Maya, but I don't like it because I made a very, very bad translation. But I was working in uh, an office of um, Gersberger Publishing Company, and with him, um, I 
illustrated um, another book for um, Alfred Roth, which was um, on the new, the new School. And then um, I uh, was in his office, uh, Gersberger's office one day, and he said, we've got an urgent uh, request from Le Corbusier because we've got to get out the last uh, latest of the Oeuvre Complet, his complete work, five-year work of the past, and he's just sent a uh, preface that he wants to uh, translate, well, we should translate, I should translate from French into English. This was an impossibility, but I wanted to do it, and I didn't do a good job. But it is published as the preface. I'm going to read this. Um, as I have redrafted it, as I should have uh, translated it. Life calls forth the poets as the epoch demands. If they respond to the call of freedom, they will cast a new light around us and such are the great opportunities which our hands still hesitate to grasp. The great theme of human enterprises is boundless, overflowing with wealth, responding to the promise of the good, rich earth. The saga of this fabulous age of the machine still waits to be written by the poets and by the builders. Can you still remember those recent events which are already shrouded in forgetfulness? For example, the great planes crossing the sky every 16 seconds, day and night, over the ocean, over the Pacific, Atlantic bearing messages, documents, words of command, and America flown to Europe, equipped to the teeth with calculators, typewriters, tanks, and jeeps. They all came, the spectacled soldiers, bank clerks, grocers, workers from the slaughterhouses of Chicago, professors, Negroes from Louisiana, all clad in the togs of war to destroy Hamburg, Berlin, Cologne, and with them, our stations, our bridges, our forge, in a storm of terrible explosions, the black nights were set far, red, green, orange, marking the targets of destruction. While it winds the earth as a network of instantaneous sounds, the whole world is in touch every second Every electron is charged with a clash of languages and interpretations. Poet, remember yet Hitler's hysteria, the helmet of the Hun. But now great works shall spread abroad to all mankind the joy of life. So, Immediately after, I had the chance then of entering the Atelier de Bastisseur of Le Corbusier. And here's the office, well known to some of you and not at all to others. It is a very extraordinary, but very simple office. It is not pretentious at all. It is a corridor in a monastery, only five meters or less, a little less wide, very narrow. You see our drawing boards on the right-hand side going all the way down. That wall is what separates us from a chapel where we could hear sometimes uh, a Bach fugue or Gregorian chants or something echoing through. He didn't like that very much, surprisingly enough. <laughs> he said on the left-hand side here they're working on the city plan. And uh, he said in my... Uh, in my cities, I will never, never put a church. They put a cathedral in Brasilia. That was not a good idea. I don't want anything to do with churches all my life. He said that. So we never, <laughs> it was a very, very strange thing. In a way, he was always making these statements which were very direct, authoritarian in a way, which later he would withdraw. But anyway, we're each working there on um, different projects, and I'm working in there on uh, projects which relate architecture to structure. And um, this was always the idea of the new world, the new city plan, the new elements 
of sun, green, and each element being a, not an apartment building, no, a neighborhood unit, complete unit. That was the important part. And we had the opportunity now, by some kind of uh, freak, in a way, with the French government, to make an experimental unit, unité d'habitation. And this is what we were working on. And this is the great symbol with this key to city planning, with this key to the future. We felt that we were working towards this, a, a great vision. This is the earliest model. We saw it all as um, white, like a poissy, a shining white in, out in the uh, uh, country. And uh, my job was to do with the structural frame partly by choice and partly by delegation for Wolchonsky. There was somebody needed to this, do this analysis of structure so that the elements could be calculated by the very small structural staff. There was a brilliant idea. And that was a uh, concrete grid, concrete frame grid, which would allow the insert of different spaces, all, all dimensions with interior spaces according to the modulo. The interior of what is being inserted here was the space being inserted into a structure, into a concrete, concrete structure. This was such a simple and such a great idea. Rodiansky helped a lot, particularly with the mechanical engineering. And so this was my job, basically. I had learned a little bit because I was living in the uh, uh, Swiss Pavilion. Swiss Pavilion was a kind of prototype for this uh, unité. It had the same system of isolating, inserting an individual, symbolic also because that is the, the human occupancy within the great structure. And so here I just show some details we put into English here that the inserted part was steel and wood coming into a concrete frame. You can see the shock, shock absorbing uh, sections down below. Isolated the per perfect um, acoustic. So this was good engineering. It was nothing to do with the poetic fantasy, but the poetic fantasy was what governed. And it is um, the principle of the uh, modular which really fascinated him at that time. I show this, it was a little bit later, cast in the concrete. But, but why? Because uh, we had by our drawing boards always the modular, and that was a mathematical thing. Uh, and this mathematical thing was extremely important. All of our dimensions had to relate to that. Wojcicki was extremely uh, concerned that no one would deviate from these, these dimensions. And that was what I worked. But when Le Corbusier came around to my table, and I think to others it was almost the same, he broke all the rules. He was the only one allowed to break the rules, and this infuriated me. We worked so hard to make everything work exactly and exactly according to the modulo, which he loved and he promoted in every lecture, including at the AA later on. The modulo was like the solution to the world and dimensions, and Le Corbusier would say, uh, you must never, never depart from the system. But when he sat down at the drawing table, he departed from it every time. And this I didn't understand at all. I must say just a few things now out of sequence slightly. And that is that he was very abrupt. And when you came to the drawing board or even rela anything relating to any project, he, he would always say, uh, no discussion, no discussion, very abrupt. He said, get on with the job, no discussion, get on with the job. And, but on Saturday morning, he said, come on in, and we sit around and we can chat in a relaxed way about anything. So he separated the work, in a way, from the dialogue of a master to students. We thought ourselves all students, Wojcicki, Brodiansky, senior people. But we loved that Saturday morning. And in that Saturday morning, um, he came in with always new things he brought in, new ideas. He came in from the Tennessee Valley in America, which he thought was so fantastic, the great dams, hydroelectric systems. He said, this is the future. This is the heroic future we must think of as man's relationship to nature, the power and the marvels of technology. So he, and he was so impressed that the buildings, all the buildings 
were all left in rough concrete, even the auxiliary buildings, straight, stripped from the form. He said, that's what we're going to do. We're going to have our buildings all Kirovic as part of the dams and this culture. So all of our buildings in the future will be beton vu. And he invented that word right there. One Saturday morning, beton vu. And he said, uh, what will happen is that we must, having got our systems, we must now use, as in his poetic message, the new found freedom. And the newfound freedom to, for him was the poetic freedom, the freedom that the hand has got no relationship to the dimensions of the head, for example. Some of these things were for me, as a young, rather naive student, uh, Stavia, we were called, in the uh, atelier, was very infuriating because it was inconsistent. And it was one of these Saturday mornings, and that was... Um, um, a very brave thing. It was only after I had got some respect, after I'd been there some time, I knew him a little bit, that I could ask him a very, very critical question. And that was, when can an architect violate rules? And his answer was so marvelous, so profound, so wise, it sums up everything about Le Corbusier for me. He said, architecture is an art, like any other art, like poetry, music, or painting. You can violate the rules, but only, only when it strengthens the art to do so. And so from then on, we have, have, have some kind of idea that he, could, he would now move away in a way from um, what he would have done in, from a, a purely, let's say, engineering uh, uh, point of view into the, the structure. I show this only because this is the first um, of the Besson Brew that came into existence, these, uh, the, this uh, a great space underneath with, with the pillory. I had the honor of um, detailing the formwork they are resting on a sand base, I believe it's a sand base, on top of a cap, on top of caissons, which were just going in at that time. That was in October. And um, then he was becoming freer and freer, moving away from the disciplines of the mathematics and so on into pure sculpture. So I think I did understand during that time the, the greatness of an individual in his poetic way who could break free and command and have the idea of a, of a great future, of a, of a plans, planned cities. Time does not allow. But I would like to say this is an example of the, what I call the odyssey, an understanding, a relationship, a personal relationship, uh, going into a certain moment in history after the war, the new world, a great man, a relationship in a way of um, uh, thinking and art. I would um, now like to come on into a different area. This is a part, if you like, of student life. I was a student in the office. And then, having worked very hard, they paid me. And I could survive in uh, Paris, which was still on rationing and um, very, very difficult uh, uh, austere life. And with that, I entered, in a way, um, the world of sculpture. I got to know um, yeah, Brancusi. I went very often to his office. But the, the movement, in a way, from the rational into the poetic, pulled by the poetic a, a poll is something which I would um, get unique uh, to Le Corbusier. So now I go to a different part of the Odyssey. Now I am no longer a student. I am living in the Arizona desert. 
and building my first building with my own hands and about $150. At the foot of the superstition mountain, uh, with my newly arrived girlfriend, Verena Gideon, and we lived um, also a really uh, austere life in the desert, inspired, I must say that, by Frank Lloyd Wright. I must skip over that event, we don't have time, and build a pavilion with the idea that the pavilion was an ele elementary form in architecture. We saw this as a relationship to Lao Tse, we saw it as a relationship uh, to, to Zen, we saw it as a relationship to the disciplines of Mies van der Rohe, but built, as I learned very simply, from the choice of Frank Lloyd Wright, which was canvas and redwood. But the idea was simply to make a space which was perfectly balanced structurally. So the placing of the bolts was an extremely important part. I show this because it was at a time before this part of the world was developed at all. This is underneath the Superstition Mountain. There's the mesa. It goes off. There's no sign of man at all. So that experience of a pavilion in its most elementary form, it never has enclosing walls, was the thought that this would be a prototype of a sophisticated and modern house that we would build for ourselves. So from this esoteric and minimal condition, I engineered, knowing a little bit now about that, a roof slab based not on reinforced concrete, but on something which was very new at that time, uh, that is post-tensioning. These are cables. They all have, you can see there, different curves. I calculated these. We had no computer. We did this by hand. And calculating the curves and then hoping it works. And so there is a, a, a form, a roof form, in the form of a grid, not leaving it up to the engineer to figure out, no. The whole enjoyment was working with the structure, understanding its mathematics, its behavior, and its balance. And that was so important. So the substructure of this really first building of this kind, and um, I checked with Arab, Arab if there was another precedent, and he, he couldn't find one. Um, was supported, of course, two columns on each base, caissons going down. We're taking seismic, that's earthquake, tying it back to the foundations, back into the hillside. And um, could I find a contractor to build it? No, I could not. So I built it myself. <laughs> and this is, of course, in that and um, in a relationship to a landscape, which in a way was the way uh, Frank Lloyd Wright would have, um, would have uh, placed it in, in the landscape. And um, with the leaving the, um, the jacking points where we jacked the cables open, all glass, well, almost all glass, you can say that, in terms of the enclosure. But then at that time, it was quite an experiment. You see here, <coughs> influence of Le Corbusier, but I haven't copied Le Corbusier. And the same thing with the glazing enclosure. I go systematic. It's much more systematic. It belongs, in a way, to the discipline of the desert pavilion, but this is a much more sophisticated space. The balance of structures ultimately extremely important. The feeling of space going with it. And um, the... Uh, technological, in a way, uh, technological way of living. We're now really into, into the uh, 20th century. And anyway, it, it didn't fall down. All my calculations were right. <laughs> but what a risk, my God. Removing the formwork, can you imagine it? <laughs> How you held your heart in your mouth? Anyway, it, it worked. And there are a lot of subtle c conditions in here which one can't see. Um, but it worked. And then I built a larger version. That's a bank in, in uh, Los Angeles. And this is um, the same system 
um, calculated, much more sophisticated way, and with a proper computer uh, program, but a large project. I won't bore you with the details, but what you see now is something of my great fascination, and that is uh, the tensioning, pulling the tendons through these cables on these curves, measuring, measuring the friction, that's what's going on right now, of the, uh, uh, of the tendons inside the cables, and then grouting tight. And um, that allows the structure, again, allows the pinpoint. You see, of the eight supports, the pinpoint, these are pivoted. They, they are designed for movement. But when you see this enormously heavy structure supported on these tiny points, which are working points, they're hinge points, it's not just to show how small it is. We need that movement down below to allow this form of uh, stress distribution with a very big grid above. It's one concrete pour. It's all poured continuously. Uh, I'm talking about the big roof grid. And um, that building survives. So now um, my education is mixed. Here's Mies van der Rohe. And he became, let's say, a friend of the family in Chicago when I was working in Chicago. And I would, um, we sometimes ask him things and so on. He doesn't talk very much, but he's a friend of the family. And when, when you eat or have the, with him after the, at the end of the day, he, he's, he's so open, and, uh, but austere and really a minimal man. And he's, he's critic, good critic, wonderful critic. So I learned the balance of design. He says, balance, I'm a heavy man. Can you see that? <laughs> and I'm supported by two little pieces of steel. I designed that chair. Not three, two pieces. That is enough. You don't need any more. And he wanted always this uh, minimum coming in. So I... In a way, I pulled away from my fascination with the Beton Blue, which I love because of the sculptural aspect, and enter his philosophy. And uh, he says, all you need is one little column, and it could be in steel. You don't need all that concrete. You have a grid of steel, you know, and that's a pavilion. That's the way to do it. You know, just one little point. We don't need any more. And so I learned how I learned from my masters. And Kobu, um, oh Kobu, Kobu, I ask, what would you do? His friends didn't call him Kob, but Kobu, Kobu, what would you do? Something surprising, obviously, something really surprising, and he's not going to repeat anything. So um, what pavilions would you do? How would you do it? And no, he, he says, I will, no, I don't do beton brew. Sorry, I'm going to do steel. And a yin-yang system, he always uses it, likes the yin-yang. So he makes the two steel pavilions on a supporting uh, over a very uh, compl much more complicated pro program. And of course, the heaviest column is where you don't need it at all and where you really should have one, a drain pipe, you know. And this is, this is the way he would play with art. You must um, only um, make exceptions when it advances the art to do so. <laughs> so he advances the art in this strange world in between architecture and, and sculpture. So much to learn from great people contradicting themselves. So I made a project. This is a stage one of the competition entry, which was for Glasgow. I was trying to come back to the British Isles. It failed. But this was a competition for the Burrell collection. And I worked this out with uh, what was um, uh, Felix, uh, Felix Samueli's office, which was now in the hands of um, uh, Frank Newby. And so I worked with Frank Newby on a, a pavilion with one column <laughs> each, each of the support points, but using uh, a bru and so on. But the idea, again, I learned from uh, local position, where a, a great pavilion over a complicated, uh, complicated uh, project. All the details in the program, very, very complicated. But the idea of having the unifying 
pavilion on top. I, well, I say Corbusier could do it. This is a complicated program, extremely complicated, and has to be satisfied. And so just these four points are the great relief here for the, um, for the, the pavilion up above. Again, Mies said, no, we do this also in uh, Berlin, a simple pavilion over a complicated program down below. This is how complicated it was down below. But instead of expressing that complication, bringing the basic space, if you like, echo of an empty space, with a, of course, with a, a rents going down in the middle of it. I don't do more. But Mies comes again. We say to Mies, Mies said, Papa, why so complicated? <laughs> He said, why don't you just make a big universal space? We make big universal space, and then you put everything loose inside of it. This is the convention hall for Chicago, uh, which was, he was working on then, and a little bit earlier with uh, Conrad Waxman. And uh, so I came back again. He said, Papa, you steal as steel. You know, so I couldn't do it like Le Corbusier. I would go in the Mies direction. My structural instincts would take me there. And so um, we started a design for a building, again, with a pivot point. And with this, um, uh, which every structural member is important, suspending a small building, actually six stories high, which is for the uh, Palace of Westminster, and um, all steel. And again, with Frank Newby, uh, with uh, Samuel Willis office, with eight points of support, the competition, they gave me third prize, but um, and it's a bridge over the Metropolitan Railway um, near, in, near the uh, House of the Parliament with the connection directly to the House of Commons, 400 MPs. And um, me said, don't worry, the relationship of uh, buildings, you, you um, stay true to your epoch. Don't let go. Stay true to your epoch. And even if you have to relate to something entirely different, relate to it. You know, this has to do with volume and space, not to do with decoration and um, uh, pseudo-Gothic. Uh, Gothic. Um, and um, uh, uh, so uh, these were very, very much impressed by uh, the um, uh, space and marks in, in Venice, where all the great buildings make a great space uh, uh, together of entirely different epochs. And each building, I don't have a photograph, unfortunately, each building uh, relating to the other beautifully without saying, no, we must relate to the next one. So there we are with um, my second attempt to come back to the <laughs> to Great Britain, only third place. And, oh, yes, the man who won the competition, I should have told you about this, really, was Prince Charles. He thought that it's much better to be a member of the family and have little pinnacles sticking up and so on. <laughs> so what you see today. So here is the master again. And um, the re I think the relationship to these Marcus masters who echoes in, you dream about this kind of thing, you know, what would Kovuk say, what would Wright say, and so on. But not uh, copying, no. Going with the principles. And um, one period of uh, Le Corbusier was uh, taking the, the, the basic uh, uh, volumes, the square, the, the, the drum, the, the pyramid, and so on. So I pushed, I had another competition entry, and I pushed the pyramid. And there's uh, the square base Egyptian pyramid, if you'd like, triangular pyramid, which doesn't occur much in history. And then today, eccentric, with the apex off the base. Easy to do. And with that, there's a whole language, and I want to go back into this sometime. I did this for a competition for um, Franklin Delano uh, Roosevelt uh, Memorial in, wa in Washington. And, um, I thought, here is a, a wonderful area to, to go into. It's solids, though, not spaces. But solids relating and making spaces. And I think it could be very good, you know. It was, uh, of course, it would be in the white marble that you should see all over in Washington, D uh, D.C. 
but the relationship of the pyramidal forms uh, is solid. So I can't say it is architecture. It's a strange, bad feeling I have, but sometimes I do it. This was not acting. Yes, in a way, it's just making spaces, and of course it is making spaces. There's a dialogue between um, a, a great elements, and I thought I could do much more. But in some of my later work, which was, no, let's say it wasn't later, I apologize. But thinking of the experience with Le Corbusier again, I go back again to what he taught me. And these forms, for example, this is in San Francisco, um, had uh, for me the importance of a dialogue with the um, uh, Roosevelt. There's a dialogue between the different um, between the different um, uh, uh, triangles, the different uh, pyramids. But here there's an opportunity to it put into work one of Le Corbusier's uh, great ideas, which was the roof, using the roof terrace as a sculptural base. So here's another project in San Francisco, which is a, a student union, using again, uh, I come back again to the use of the pyramids. I'm not so happy about it because I think it was not the right thing to do now. It was, uh, these are spaces, nevertheless, very interesting. On the back were auditoriums so that you could use the spaces going up. It was so that um, you could have uh, uh, a, a, a different activities from a certain community. And this community um, was for students. The client for students at a time of the great hippie movement. So I participated, and I was the only architect who participated in that epoch, at that moment, you could say, in the great um, odyssey, that working with the hippies, understanding them, but not conceiving weaknesses, but using the strengths of what I had learned. And here is a seismic area, earthquake area, where the uh, triangular, you see the diagonals, have a, a certain important meaning. That although I am doing things to do with geomet geometric forms, which I, I love, and I say a lot inspired by Le Corbusier, I do want the structure to be pure and absolutely logical. So the seismic interest in developing a structure, this goes on plan with octagonals of, uh, of triangles, but is taking the lateral forces in a very, very rigid way. We precast on the job. They change their sections, the concrete part, changes its sections from the top to the bottom according to the stress and stability and connections. The steel connection is, a, is at the top, but with these, it was very important to say, now I come in and I feel I work with these spaces. And these spaces will also, these diagonals will also be supporting the, um, the pyramidal de development. But the point I wanted to say is that, although it is a basically a sculptural project, it has a very pure structure. And here it is as it gets uh, filled in under construction. So here um, the rules again, I don't say the rules exactly, but the principles of Le Corbusier, the drainage of waters being a basic uh, a, a, a feature going, being exposed up above. On the right, the, the uh, beton blue structure and a surface, a white uh, hyperbolic paraboloid surface, just like a shield, very separate. And now for the community, the people, as I say, and I would like to say, is that architecture, space, structure, and people, the most neglected part of the three is people. It would be good if every presentation required the presence of people. How do they relate to it? And so with um, coming in a way, a, a kind of um, full circle, um, there's not a matter of imitating or joining in the school of 
one master, but a learning, understanding, and working in a way with a constant inspiration of everybody. And the inspiration, I must say this, was um, first here in the Architectural Association with students. And it was with these um, the students here that I understood very, very well the importance of providing for humanity and thinking of humanity in, in the future. I would like to just say uh, towards the end, although I do thank this relationship of being an apprentice to some great people, and I include Miss van der Rohe, although I was not working, I was not uh, at the IIT, I was not like many students who came all over the world to him. I was working alongside of him on very similar projects. So we had a dialogue between the office I was working with and Mises' office. Time does not allow that I can go much further. But I wanted to say, just once again, that um, I've been away for 60 years. During that time, it has been an odyssey. I call it the odyssey of the 20th century, not 21st, going to 21st, but 20th century. I've really experienced this, and I've translated it whenever I could uh, into my own work. But I will go back always to the very beginning, when I was inspired, and that was here. I was inspired in three particular places. I was inspired by the library upstairs. The library was a wonderful, wonderful place for thinking and looking out into Bedford Square and imagining, thinking, wanting to join in what we could read and see in books. But more important than that, I go back again, was the stimulus coming from the students themselves. I learned from my fellow students an enormous amount. And for that, I thank the Architectural Association.